positions at the uh, University of Arizona, uh, Hartford Institute of Astrophysics, and University of Montreal. He, got, uh, he became a uh, faculty at the University of Toronto in 1989. Professor Yi is probably uh, best known for his seminal work uh, in CNAC-1 cluster redshift survey, and also uh, pioneering work in the cluster rest sequence method, uh, which has become like a standard way of searching for distant clusters nowadays. So today he will tell us about uh, the galaxy uh, evolution in clusters at Richard uh, 1 and beyond. Let's welcome Paul. Uh, thank you. Um, is everybody hearing me? So, um, I've been here for a little over four and a half months on a six um, month uh, uh, not vacation, I was going to say vacation, it feels like a uh, sabbatical at, um, here at, at HIDA and at um, um, ASIAA. And um, so the six months went by very quickly. And to say this is actually the third time. I have taken a uh, longish uh, visit uh, to uh, Taipei and, and to uh, ASIA, and each time I enjoy Taipei more. Um, and um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about specifically about galaxy evolution, how galaxies evolve in galaxy cluster, and specifically at relatively high redshift of around one uh, in the universe. A little bit um, under half the age, current age. And so, what I'm going to do is have a short introduction about why we study galaxy clusters, and then we'll uh, go. I go and describe uh, two um, related uh, surveys of galaxy clusters, the sparse survey and the G-class survey, and how we use the data from these two surveys. One's an imaging survey, one is a spectroscopic survey to look at what's called the quenching of star formation in um, galaxy that in falling into cluster on the field. Um, the quenching of star formation here means we have galaxies that are sitting out there normally forming stars. And when it gets close and fall into galaxy cluster, we find that the galaxies, the, the star formation stuck, and we call it quenching. And this is one of the major so environmental effects on star formation in the universe. Uh, it turned out that star formation depends on the property of the galaxy, but also depends on where the galaxy is. And we're going to look at this effect of the uh, suppression of star formation in galaxy in the cluster using three different set of data. Um, and the rest of one. And, um, then I will summarize the talk in the end. Uh, this is just a list, a partial list of all the collaborators in these two surveys, uh, specifically uh, people who have contributed significantly to uh, the three or four papers uh, from which these results come. Uh, so, so why do we study galaxy clusters? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, one of them is when you find a galaxy cluster, they are at about the same distance from you because they are clustered together. And that put them all in the same distance, which means they should cosmologically evolve at simultaneously, very much like when you study uh, star clusters. All the stars in a star cluster will form at the same time and they evolve. Well, those are a little bit different with uh, galaxy cluster. And uh, the other thing is galaxy cluster basically mark the densest area uh, in the large scale structure of the universe. 
and they will tell us about cosmology and also uh, galaxy formation. But before I jump into that, with uh, having one wheel back on a few jargon uh, and some factoids about galaxy and galaxy cluster, which I want to present before I talk about uh, galaxy evolution. So um, I think almost all of you know what redshift is, and it's a definition. One part of is equal to the observed wavelength divided by the rest wavelength. And you can interpret that as a Doppler effect, but more properly, you, you interpret that as an expansion of space, causing the uh, wavelength to change. So in fact, that's equal to the, uh, the scale factor of the universe, uh, the ratio of the scale factor of the universe from, uh, from now divided by the scale factor at the time you see. And, um, and as you also also know, the universe is currently thought of as 13.7 giga year old. In fact, I think these are go down to two more digits, which I can put down. Um, and at Redshift 1, which is where I talk about, uh, the universe is about 6 billion years old or about 7.8 billion years ago from today. Uh, so the universe is, we are a little bit beyond half of going back to half of the beginning of the universe by looking at LC Redshift 1. Now, um, the two units that I'm going to use a lot, which Right down here, so, so you have some idea what it is. Uh, megaparsec is uh, 10 to the 6 parsec, <coughs> turned out to be about 3 times 10 to the 19 kilometers. And the megaparsec distance scale is relevant because that's about how big a galaxy cluster is. And that's what you know, the number I will use for size. Um, mass, we talk about mass in stellar mass, which uh, means the mass of our sun. So our sun has a stellar mass of 1. One stellar mass is about 2 times 10 to the 13 kilograms. Um, now, galaxies. Um, you all know galaxy is a conglomeration of billions and billions of stars. But in fact, in a galaxy, only about uh, one third of the mass is in very large, which form the stars. And the rest are in what's called dark matter, which uh, I think all of you have heard about also. And of the baryon, maybe one half to uh, one fifth, depending on uh, the galaxy, uh, is actually in star. The rest are in gas that you cannot really see, at least in optical light. So uh, when a typical galaxy have stellar mass, that means mass that are in star, is typically about 10 to 9, 10 to 11 solar masses. So you can think of it as having a billion to hundred billion stars. There are galaxies that are a lot smaller, there are some galaxies that are somewhat bigger, but 10 to 11 is very close to being the biggest galaxy ever, maybe by another factor of 10. So when we look at a galaxy, we are looking at a relatively small fraction of the stuff that is in the galaxy and in the galaxy cluster. Now for galaxy cluster, Uh, cluster typically have uh, a total mass from about 10 to the 14 solar mass to, 10 to, the, to several times 10 to the 15 solar masses. And it's a totally artificial definition that if a group of galaxy gravitationally, uh, in gravitational equilibrium, that is less than 10 to the 14 of those solar mass, we call them galaxy group. Um, and when you look at a you know, the hundreds or thousands of galaxies in a galaxy cluster, they're moving around in order to counteract gravitational collapse. The typical velocity, they're moving around between, around the typically for the order of a thousand kilometers per second, going from uh, several hundred to you know, well over a thousand real masses. And the other thing about galaxy cluster is that in the gravitational potential, uh, there are there's this intercluster gas, which actually contains more of the baryon than the star themselves, who is sitting in this gravitational poten potential well, and they're moving very, uh, they're very high temperature, they're moving very quickly in order to, again, counteract the tendency to collapse. And typically, they emit in gas rays because they have to be hot enough in order not to collapse in 
typically in the hundreds of uh, millions of degrees. So in fact, uh, the one of the main kind of objects you can see with an X-ray telescope out in space is the hot gas from X-ray. And as I mentioned, there's a sort of a typical size uh, for a cluster. Now, a cluster does not have edges. It just you know, continue uh, going slowly down uh, as you go further in density, as you go further up. And we typically define a size, what we call R200, which you will hear we use. And this is the a radius in which the mass encodes by R200 is 200 times the closure mass density of the universe. It, this number is used because in n-body simulation, it turned out that around here is where inside this radius things are actually in equilibrium or realized. Outside of it, they're not realized. So typically this is within, you know, 10, 20 percent of the real radius of the system. And, 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 and people use this as the, uh, the reference radius and allow you to scale different customers by using this initial radius. And as I mentioned before, this around a megaparsec in size. Okay, so uh, let's look at sort of the three main things that we study with galaxy clusters, at least I classify it in uh, You probably heard about all of these in talks in this series in time in the last year or two. Uh, that the, the flow of structure and cosmology uh, is one of the main use for studying galaxy clusters. So here is sort of a very uh, um, cartoon-like diagram of these are actually in body simulation. So what the universe looks like at redshift, uh, this is 1.5 or so is 1 and, and, and current time. And um, the universe started as a uniform uh, distribution of dark matter and Photon and electron, and when they start collapsing, you can see that more and more structure form and collapse. And galaxy cluster actually marks the place where different filament in, in, uh, connect or intersect. That's where galaxy cluster starts. So in certain sense, galaxy cluster basically map out the densest region in the large scale structure. And by looking at the distribution of galaxy cluster as a function of mass and the average density at different redshift, you can actually constrain the model of the cosmology in the sense that uh, with different amount of matter in the universe, the universe would collapse into the large scale structure at different rates. And galaxy cluster allow you to trace that relatively easily. So that's one of the primary use, if you want, application of having very large sample of galaxy um, and another interesting uh, so application of galaxy cluster, which become uh, now more and more uh, fashionable, you like, or more and more people start doing more with it, is that you can actually use a galaxy cluster's mass as a gravitational lensing telescope. So when you have a huge a, 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 a gravitational field, and you have light passing behind it to you, the gravitational field will deflect the light, very much like a lens would deflect the light. So under the right geometry, you can actually magnify objects that are behind this gravitational <coughs> lens. So Galaxy cluster obviously are the best lens there is. Here I'm showing you two examples of um, these lenses. Uh, both found by the Red uh, Sequent Cluster Survey. So this one, uh, this one yellowish object is actually the galaxy in the cluster. And then you see these uh, arcs. There's one here, the real nice one here in the red, which you probably cannot see is here. Uh, they're, they're, they're actually different arcs that are uh, magnification of galaxies sitting well behind the cluster. So for example, this red arc you cannot quite see. It's actually a redshift almost five. Um, and here's a more uh, drastic one uh, with uh, cluster 
again, a relatively low redshift. Uh, in this case, you know, it's only around uh, like 6. And this beautiful art is actually part of this galaxy, uh, which is about redshift 1.7. Uh, and the magnification here is about 17 times. So in the galaxy, its, pitch, its uh, structure gets stretched by the gravitational lens. And the total amount of light in this is about 17 times the actual light from the galaxy. Right. Um, the best way to demonstrate this arc on the everyday thing is you ever break a wine glass and with a long stem and a leg. You can break it and use the bottom. And you put it against some light, you will see the arc. It's equivalent to a lens that has, that has a curvature like this, rather than the typical lens curvature that now, what I'm going to talk about is primarily about the cluster themselves rather than what uh, we use the clusters. And this usually is divided into two. One is looking at what we call cluster physics, which very often meant the gas that's in the cluster. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here is two X-ray pictures taken by, by the Chandra X-ray telescope. And of two uh, clusters, this one is a relative nearby one. And you can see that the X-ray gas have, so this is about uh, you know, the size of the cluster. And you can see that the X-ray gas is not uniform. It has holes and different kind of things. And people call this weather, you know, yes, uh, because it's gas. And, 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 and we believe that uh, this hole in the X-ray is created by relativistic relativistic electrons from a jet, from a, what we call an active galactic nuclei, pushing the gas out. <coughs> and in fact, this insert here shows, I think, the same scale, the radio emission from, this, from the central galaxy of this cluster, which is here. And you can see how, where there's radio emission, the X-ray gas has been pushed out. And this shows you the interaction of plasma, how in a huge space, where you can actually see all these things happening. The other one is an is, is, uh, interesting cluster, or two clusters. This shows one cluster here, the X-ray, and the other cluster is here. And this one, we believe, have just gone through it, like a bullet. That's called a bullet cluster. No, that's not the bullet cluster. It is called a bullet cluster. <coughs> and you can see that you have two hot uh, gas ball, one running, the small one running through the big one, and you, you see the shell. The uh, shock uh, bow here as it goes through like that. And so using an X-ray telescope, you can actually look at you know, how the uh, fluid dynamic works and, and uh, of these very hot gas and tell us a bit about uh, the structure of uh, property of these kind of gas. Now, the main topic I'm really going to talk about is galaxy evolution. And about 30 years ago, uh, there were two seminal work, real classic work in galaxy evolution. They are really sort of the first robust indication that galaxy are not simply galaxy just sitting randomly, they're all the same uh, distributed on the sky, but they have certain property, certain way they're distributed, and that as you go back in time, they change. And the universe all of a sudden become very dynamic because of that. Um, one is a paper by uh, Alan Dressler in 1980, which uh, primarily delineated what's called the, uh, the uh, morphology density relation, the density morphology relation. And <coughs> what Dressler did was he took uh, photographic plates, which covered a reasonable large area, uh, centered on 10 galaxy clusters. So this is 1980, there's no CCD, there's no digital electronic imaging, you know, it's film. I don't know how many people still not film, know what film is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, with, uh, anybody, uh, who are the people who have, who have used a film camera? <laughs> there you go, there's still, still some people. Uh, so imagine you take a photographic plate about this big, literally this big, and you take a picture, pointed toward uh, nearby clusters and nearby. And then what Alan did was uh, 
very laboriously using a little microscope, look at every single object, classify them as whether it's spiral galaxy, elliptical galaxy, or S0 galaxy, and look at the location. And then write it down, and then, you know, uh, this is all by hand, okay? And um, now, galaxy are divided into several different types. And what uh, Dressler looked at, divide them into basically the three major types. One is spiral galaxy, which you all know, they have nice spiral arm. Elliptical galaxy are the one that <coughs> looks just like a ball of <coughs> stars. And then there's something called S0 galaxy, which are basically a spiral galaxy without the dark lane of the spiral. So imagine us a galaxy with a little ball of star in the middle and then a disk with no gas, which is just plain star. And, and then what he did was he plot the frac population fraction, so like how many percentage of galaxy are spiral and elliptical, versus the projected galaxy density on the photographic plate. And what he found is this relate, very remarkable relationship that as you go to denser and denser area with a more and more galaxy, the fraction of galaxy that are elliptical rise very steeply. And the fraction of spiral galaxy drop is almost not if you look at the densest region in the universe. And whereas S0 is sort of, uh, you can say they almost all compensate for each other. <coughs> and, and this really is a relationship that tells you that depending on where you are, you have different kinds of galaxies. People have an inkling of this, uh, I would say even 20 years, 30 years before 1980. But it was never put in a quantitative term until the rest of the group. It's just so monumental. Now, the, the other um, real major piece of work on galaxy is the, what's called, a, today called the butcher omler effect, also in the 1980s. So Butcher and Omler, they took pictures of galaxy clusters at different redshifts, uh, all the way up to about redshift 0.4 or so. Now, in 1980, you can barely go out to this far and detect anything. Of course, nowadays, we're talking about redshift 1. And then they looked at the color of the galaxy in the cluster, and then measured what they call the blue galaxy fraction. So some galaxy are blue, some galaxy are red. In fact, specifically, the elliptical galaxy are red and spiral galaxies are blue in general. And what they found is that the fraction of blue galaxy increases with redshift. Now this is, you know, at those in those days, these are literally all the galaxy clusters that are known at redshift point four. It's really hard work to actually do the uh, take picture and then do the photography. And essentially, uh, the major question that's related to these two plots, as it turned out, is how what happened to star formation when um, galaxies are in different environments. Right here is environment versus the type of galaxy. Okay. The type of galaxy here is related to how much star formation that's going. When there's star formation, the galaxy looks blue, and when there's no star formation, the galaxy looks red. And that's because when you're forming star, um, you have these very massive stars that are being created. The massive stars are very blue because they're very hot, but the massive stars also die very quickly. They have very short lifetime, so they occur in the nucleus very quickly. And once you turn off the star formation, all these blue stars would die off in 10, 50, 100 million years, and you're left with older star, right? Our sun, or even uh, less massive star that are red. So, so that's why star formation has to be controlled for all of this. And so here we are, 30 some years later, we are still looking at the same question that are posted by these two results 30 years ago. Although I have to say, when they wrote the paper in those days, they probably did not appreciate the whole um, connection star formation uh, and, and you know, where, where all this is going, although I think they do know that this means the star formation is changing uh, with pressure. So let me introduce another uh, diagram here, which allows us to interpret uh, these results. So this is what's called color magnitude diagram, where you plot the magnitude, which is the luminosity, uh, 
you don't have to worry what Manchu is, is minus 2.5 times log of the crust. But uh, negative is brighter. So the bright galaxies are here. Here's the color, which is basically the ratio of two still of um, light coming from two different uh, uh, wavelengths. You see defined by filters. And the red is this way and blue is this way. And here, what you see is that galaxy actually sit in a specific place on the color match with diagram. Uh, there's a bunch of them sitting at the red place. In fact, this is what the red sequence is, which you heard Jen King uh, talk about in the introduction. And these are the blue gaps, and then between the gap. Now, this gap is not as prominent if you look at um, like in galaxy clusters. So this is from local galaxy. that are galaxies everywhere, not necessarily in clusters. And that's where, what galaxy look like when you plot them on these two parameters. And here is a schematic of this, uh, where again, luminosity here, color here, and you have a blue cloud, which you cannot see, but there's something blue in here, and the red system. And uh, when the star formation um, stops, so imagine galaxy sits over here when they're forming star. And if you do something to it and make the star formation stop, it will actually migrate over to here. Okay, because it becomes bluer and fainter. And it migrates very quickly. So that in between, there's actually a sort of gap in the, in the distribution. And some people call it the green valley because it's, I guess green is between blue and red. Um, and it's a valley because there's a little gap. And now, and so the major question of galaxy evolution is, um, you know, when you have a galaxy that's formed, and eventually it will go over to the red sequence, which is what we also call red and dead, because they're not forming stars anymore. You know, what costs them to do it? And typically there are two ways of doing it. One is the so-called mass quenching. We still don't really understand exactly how that works, but the more mass of a galaxy is, it moves over there faster. But then we also find that moving over there uh, is also connected with the environment of the galaxy, where the galaxy happens to be sitting. And we know that, or we think that when galaxy, so imagine a galaxy cluster sitting here. Remember, it's a very large gravitational potential. You have all those other galaxies sitting out there, and some of them will get captured into that potential. And they used to be forming stars sitting happily in this blue cloud. But once they start going to the cluster, Something happened to them. They stop the star formation. They turn into um, a red and dead galaxy. That's what's called a red sequence. So we will primarily look at, you know, what, um, if I look at redshift one, uh, why or how this happened, or what is the, what is the way this happened. But we don't still don't really have a good handle of the mechanism. And. This actually shows you that in a galaxy cluster, these are actually uh, data from uh, my former student, uh, Tongo, you know, 20 some years ago, his master's thesis. Um, these are uh, color match with diagram in which you can see the red sequence. These are color match with diagram point that tells the toward galaxy cluster different direction, different distance from it, from local all the way out to about. Redshift 0 0.7, 0 0.8, which is about uh, halfway to the uh, to Big Bang time. And you can see that there's a very prominent red sequence. Here the picture switch, the bright galaxy on this side. And the red galaxy, gal red galaxy is this way, bright galaxy is this way. And in fact, in the galaxy cluster, when we look at the red and dead galaxy, they form a sequence that are very tight. The, this, the, uh, the dispersion here is only a few percent if you don't count measurement error, like three or four percent of both. And, and they're a very tight sequence of uh, galaxies. And in fact, the rest sequence method for finding galaxy cluster is based on the fact that galaxy, galaxy cluster have these red galaxies with very well-defined colors. And also, uh, near the center, there are more of these so that by looking galaxy at some color, we can pick out you know, the concentration of these uh, red galaxies. And that defines as a marker of where galaxy clusters are. 
So that's basically what the web feature is. That's what we did. Now, we spent a lot of time, a lot of resources looking for high redshift cluster. And one of the main reasons is, you know, all the three things that I <coughs> described briefly, the using cluster as cosmology and study large scale structure, look, using it for lensing and looking at, um, we try to study how galaxy evolves in different environments. They all would do much better if you look farther and farther out rather than just using, looking at very close things. And so, for many, many years, the effort to try to find galaxy clusters that are more than halfway you know, across the universe, basically, uh, have been going on. And there are basically three major methods we can do that. And, and so I list this as a menu, with a dollar sign, to tell you how much they cost. So before you choose, think about whether you can afford it. Uh, one is using X-ray. Remember I told you that galaxy cluster have um, all these hot gas that emit very strongly in X-ray as a gas ball. So if you have an X-ray telescope, you can look for these hot X-ray emission and identify what the galaxy cluster is. Now, this is expensive because you can only do X-ray observation out in space. So we say typically you need hundreds of millions of dollars to do one of these experiments. And, um, the, the other method, which also depends on the hot gas in the cluster, is called the sciatic stability effect. And so you all know what CMB is, the cosmic microwave background, which is a uniform um, background of uh, uh, microwave radiation um, from the Earth, looking from the Earth, is about 3 point, about 2.7 degrees. And what happens to these uh, CMB photons when they go past a hot ball of gas is that inverse Compton scatter, shifting the hot body structure slightly. So that, so that if you look at this perfect screen of CMB, which has its own structure, when there's a cluster, you would see, if you looked at the um, railing to the long side of the uh, black body peak, you would see a little dark hole because the temperature has shifted, or, or the uh, spectrum has shifted, so that you have less um, in, uh, light there. And this is due to Compton scatter. So you can actually do this from the ground in the space by looking at sub using submillimeter telescopes and look at this, uh, the cosmic background radiation and identify these little dark spots. And then you say, ah, there must be a cluster there. And then you go and take a picture, an optical picture of it, to confirm that there's a cluster. So this is called the EDZ uh, survey. And it is only six or seven years ago that people can actually carry out survey like this and find new clusters. People have seen this effect by pointing the telescope at known clusters. And typically, these experiments cost tens of millions of uh, dollars in the US. And uh, the best known one is a South Pole telescope sitting at the South Pole, where um, the cold temperature and the somewhat high elevation allow you to get very excellent condition to observe the sun. Now, if you don't want to build your own telescope, spend tens and hundreds of million dollars, uh, you can go to the budget model. Uh, here, you use what people, how people used to use to find galaxy clusters by looking for galaxies, like a galaxy cluster. So there's many galaxies, but there's a galaxy cluster. Now, that's how galaxy cluster ori originally identified, looking at optical field. But the problem when you try to find them far away is that between you and the cluster, there's this long column of galaxies projected onto your galaxy cluster. So that the enhancement of galaxy count coming from the cluster become much smaller. So it's actually, you have a lot of problem deciding whether something's a galaxy cluster or just a bunch of galaxies along the line of sight that are projected together. And it's around the year 2000 that uh, when uh, Mike Gladder, my student, and I started using this method, using multicolor, instead of using just one filter, we can use two filters and identify the best sequence uh, by looking at slices of different color, um, which allow you to separate uh, galaxies in color space, which happen to map onto redshift space. 
So give you a slight um, advantage in, in, in teasing.